Well, we're in a series called Protagonist, and uh, just as an advertisement on Sunday mornings, as has been alluded to already, um, we are mainly focusing in worship in the Old Testament, the Old Testament pointing to uh, the coming of the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. Uh, but in old in uh, Sunday school uh, with Sarah, uh, each week they are looking at a different gospel and focusing on the anticipation, the coming of Christ. And uh, so I think you've done Matthew and Mark, right? And so Luke and John are still left if you want to hit that the next two uh, Sundays. I encourage you to do that. I think it's a rich time. Um, so protagonist, what does that mean? Well, last week we defined what protagonist is. The protagonist is the one who plays the lead role, the good guy, the hero. The protagonist is the chief actor in a story for which the plot you know, could not develop. Um, and I use the example of Jason Bourne. He's the protagonist in the Bourne series, but um, I thought I'd go in a different direction this week. You know, Luke Skywalker is the protagonist in the Star Wars trilogy, the main character, the lead role, sort of the focus, the actor who is significant for the development of the story. Uh, George Lucas wrote the script for the Star Wars trilogy. So George Lucas <coughs> wrote those, and so he knew everything there was to know about Luke Skywalker because he was the creator. He invented it. He was the writer. And so uh, he knew everything that anyone could possibly ever know about Luke Skywalker because he created him. Are you with me so far? Okay. But uh, there's no way for Luke Skywalker to actually know George Lucas unless George Lucas wrote himself into the story as one of the characters. So Luke Skywalker, the main character, could never know the creator unless the creator wrote himself into one of the movies. Does that make sense? And so this is really the mystery of the incarnation. The incarnation simply means that God became flesh. The incarnation is God in a body. And so there's no way we're in the play right now, we're in the story, and there's really no way for us to fully know God on this side of heaven, and yet he knows all about us because he created us. How can we know him? Well, we can know him because God wrote himself into the story so that we could know him. But that's a small glimpse into what's happening in this moment. He became one of us to rescue us from inside the story in a way that we would never expect. Nobody, nobody would have written it like it was written. There's no way that we would have written the story like he wrote it. God enters the story without fanfare. No red carpet, no celebrities, no paparazzi. We want the glitz. We want the glam, we want the power, we want the status. We would want, we would write it so that he would wipe out the Romans and get them out of the Holy Land. We would have written it differently. For sure we would not have all written the story of God entering the story as a helpless baby boy. Born to an unmarried, pregnant teenager. Hello. The mystery of the incarnation is that the author of the story writes himself into the story and takes the lead role. He becomes the protagonist of the story so that we can see him, so that people can touch him, so that we can hear his voice, we can know about him, study his teachings, and see what he's like. Emmanuel, God with us. There are times when we can sense his presence more than at other times. Would you agree? It's just how it is. We go through uh, rich seasons and we go through some dry seasons. There's times where we sense him more 
and sometimes when we don't sense him as much. Sometimes we sense him when we're on the mountaintop and everything's going great. We just really draw close to him like Moses did and Elijah did and like Peter, James, and John did when Jesus was transfigured on the mount before them. God wrote himself into the story, but sometimes it's difficult to sense his presence when things aren't going the way that you'd like them to go. Like when you're hurting, or you get bad news, or you're lonely, or you're depressed, or one thing goes sideways, just one thing goes sideways and it steals your joy. Maybe that happened to you this week. Maybe there's a lot going on in your life, but just one or two things take you down into the valley. Everything's going great, except for maybe one or two things. When you look at scripture, we think about valleys. You know, there will be like mountains kind of on each side and just a small, you know, path to go through to get to where you're going. Um, in the scriptures, uh, battles often actually took place in the valleys um, strategically, right? Um, you can't go right, you can't go left, it's either forward or retreat. Some of you might be in the midst of a valley today, the valley of desperation, the valley of pain, uh, the valley of loneliness. Uh, we enjoy God on the mountaintop, but really it's, it's in the valley where we often grow in our faith and we get stronger. So we're going to look at Psalm 84 today. What joy for those whose strength comes from the Lord, who have set their minds on a pilgrim to Jerusalem. When they walk through the valley of weeping, it will become a place of refreshing springs. The autumn rains will clothe it with blessings. They will continue to grow stronger. Where do they grow stronger? On the mountaintop? No, in the valley, right? And each one of them will appear before God in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. So, what is the valley of weeping? Um, there was a, a tree. So this uh, was uh, the valley of weeping, the valley of Baca. It was a geographic place. And there was a tree there that would ooze out sap as you walk by the tree people said it was they called it the reaper it, it looked like the tree was crying and that's why it's called the valley of weeping anytime you see a valley in the bible you see a place that's very dangerous very dangerous um like you know you know when you're like It's interesting because uh, um, Mark and Mary Craigman, who, who I visited their house in Detroit, and they, I said, well, how, you know, how is it here? And well, you know, it's, it's pretty fine, but you only literally have to go one or two blocks over, and it's very dangerous. It's that much of a demarcation that you can just be in harm's way, not very far off. Well. The valley was dangerous. There were thorns and thistles. There were wild animals. Uh, it was a strategic place for thieves because you could only go straight or retreat, so they're kind of trapped. That's where uh, you could possibly be robbed. In fact, it was a very difficult thing to get through a valley without something bad happening. And that's why the, the psalmist says, what joy, go back to verse 5 here, what joy comes for those whose strength comes from the Lord. As Christians, we get our strength from the Lord. We don't get it from ourselves. We can't manufacture it. We don't have it within us. We rely upon God for strength. And you have joy when you know where your strength comes from. And if you don't know God, then all you have is all you have. Would you agree? But for those of you who are Christ followers, we believe that we have a strength that goes beyond what we have. We have access to a heavenly strength. His strength 
takes over when ours runs out. It's kind of like when you're, you're lifting weights, if you've ever lifted weights, and you're on the last set of reps. I haven't done it a lot, obviously, but I have some. I have a little bit of experience. And so like you're really trying to max out that last set of reps and you've got almost nothing left in the tank and you have somebody spot you and they're kind of helping you with the bar and they're saying, come on, bro, you can do it, right? And they got both hands on the bar and they're helping you lift it and they're, they're actually probably doing like 90%, right? <laughs> Or maybe they're doing all of it because you're just out of gas and your your chest is on fire, right? And they're like, you got this, it's all you. It's all you. And you know it's not all you because you know you're not doing anything. <laughs> if you're in the valley, you have access to that kind of power where God takes over. He does. When our strength runs out, his takes over. And he says, you've got this. Why? Not because we have any strength, but because he's helping us lift the bar in our lives. So if you're in the valley, you have access to the power of a good God who wants to help you through the valley. Now the Bible doesn't say that those, uh, say those are blessed who try to make it on their own. Or those are blessed who uh, are super determined. I'm going to pull myself up by my bootstraps. One of the big problems in our world today, I think, is that we're, we almost despise having to rely on others. There is a spirit of independence. I think part of it, you know, is just our culture because that's how our country started, Right? Independence Day. We don't need Britain, right? So our, our, our nation was kind of founded on that rugged individualism that I think Teddy Roosevelt talked about. Correct me if I'm wrong. We want to be financially independent. Uh, we don't want to have to ask for help. Do you need help? No, I'm good. Really? Okay. Why don't we want to depend on others? We don't want maybe to have to trust other people or rely on others or even maybe even rely on God. Well, here's the reality of the matter. We are not created to be independent. People say, well, I don't need to go to church. Mm, no, you do. You need to be in community. We were made to be in community with one another. We need each other. We're better together. And it's not just about what you get when you come. It's also about what you can give by being here. You may bless somebody else because of something that you say or smile or handshake or just listening to their problems, what they're going through, saying, I know what you're going through. I'll pray for you. It's not just about what you can get when you come, but what you can give as well. We were made to be in community with one another. And we were created by our God to depend on Him and to depend on others. Blessed are you when you depend on Him whose strength comes from Him. I'm, uh, I'm listening to... Uh, um, I just got the Audible app recently and so I'm listening to books because I, I don't read. I'm a terrible reader. My mom was an English teacher and she would buy me eight books a month. Hey, you know, not nah, that's an exaggeration, but probably once a month. Hey, I, I saw this book. I, she loved to read. I did not. What a disappointment for an English teacher. So I, I have trouble just sitting down reading. Home. So I've been like listening to books. Like, woo! I can like sort of read a book, but you know, have it read to me, like it's you know carpet time in kindergarten. <laughs> Anyway, I digress. So I'm listening to the autobiography of Pat Summit. Um, she won many national titles as the women's coach at uh, Tennessee. And uh, so some of the stories are pretty interesting. But in the early 70s, um, before Title IX, they, 
like one example is just crazy. Their, her first season, they had to make their own uniforms. And because some of them had had home economics, which some of you younger people will have to Google, um, it, there was like Tennessee was like all over stitched and the number, some of the numbers were big, some of the numbers were small, it just looked like a mess. Anyway, that's kind of, you know, did the men have that? No, they had, you know, uniforms made for them. Anyway, women, you've had it tough the whole time. Anyway, so she, you know, one of the things that, one of the stories that she told is in one of those early days, they had a, uh, every game that they went to, they had like a 15 passenger van and she drove the van. All right. And so uh, the men, they would fly to their games, but they're in this little, you know. So uh, they were invited to a barbecue by one of the boosters, and they're driving there to this barbecue in their 15 passenger van, and the van got a flat tire. So she goes, and there's a spare tire, but there's no jack. And so what she did, what any reasonable person would do, uh, while she changed the tire, she had her team lift the van. And they did. And she reflects back on that story. She wondered how none of them got a hernia or blew out their back. So, you know, whatever you do, don't ask for help, right? We can manage this on our own. We are fiercely independent, but we weren't made that way. We were made to be dependent upon God and one another. What joy for those whose strength comes from the Lord, who have set their minds on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. I love that. We're on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. The valley of weeping is not the destination. You may be in the valley, but you're, you're heading for a city of refuge, a city of safety, a place of peace. But to get to that city of refuge, sometimes we've got to go through the valley of tears, the valley of weeping. Sometimes the valley of tears is the pathway to the place of peace. God will always prepare a way for me. And his spirit gives me strength when I'm weak. When they walk through the valley of weeping, it will become a place of refreshing springs. The autumn rains will clothe it with blessings. So again, as I said, the valley is not permanent. I'm just passing through. My God will get me through this. Psalm 23, King David said, Even though I walk through the of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Emmanuel. God with us. David understood that concept that he is with us. He's not distant. He's not separated. He's not unconcerned. He's present. I may be in the valley, but God is with me. I may be in a difficult time, but God's going to get me through. I may be hurting right now, but I'm not going to be hurting forever. My God's going to pull me through. The valley of weeping when you're there, you just want out. You just want out. But here's the thing. God may show you that the way through the valley is not out of the valley, and that the road to the path of peace is often through the valley. As they pass through the valley of weeping, they make it a place of springs. In other words, when you're in a dry place, what do you do? You dig a well. You put out a container, you collect some water so that when God sends the rain, you have something there. You put out your container to make room. You make room for him. Maybe God hasn't set the rain yet and is dry. But I, one thing I've learned by following Jesus, if you make room for him, if you make room for him, if you make room for the presence of God, if you make room for the provision of God, if you make a well, but it hasn't rained yet, it's gonna rain. He will provide what you need. So you make preparation for his presence. 
kind of like God saying, you will show me your faith and I'll show you my faithfulness. If you prepare for me, I will show up. Show me your faith and I'll show you my faithfulness. You know, Jesus did this in his ministry. Actually, he came across the man with the withered hand and he probably was kind of hiding it, you know, because he was embarrassed about his condition. And instead, Jesus said, uh, he didn't say, I'm just going to heal you. Jesus asked the man to stretch out his hand so everybody could see it. And when he did, then Jesus healed him. It's kind of like you, you know, you got to do something first. You got to, you got to show me your faith and I'll show you my faithfulness. I will not let you down. How about the man who could not walk for uh, 38 years? Jesus did what? He didn't say you're healed. He said, pick up your mat that he sat on and get up. In other words, you, you've got to take the first step, but I'm, I'm going to provide for you. Show me your faith, and I'll show you my faithfulness. God sees your pain. He hears your prayer. He knows the situation that you're in. He knows your situation far better than you know about your situation. One of the great promises in Scripture is found in James. If you will draw near to me, God says, I will draw near to you. That's a promise you can take to the bank. In the Old Testament, if you seek me, you will find me. In other words, if I make room for you, then God will draw near. He will come. Maybe you're here and maybe you haven't sensed his presence in a long time. It's time for you to, to dig a well and he will fill it. Some of you maybe need an encounter with God. But here's the thing. He... He rarely reveals himself to people who are in a hurry or who are independent and don't think that they need him. You know, in coaching, I, somebody thinks they know it all. They don't, they don't really need my help. They don't really listen or they don't look me in the eyes. Like, I still try to coach that person, but I'm, I'm not going to bend it over backwards because they don't have a heart to get better. But they can do it themselves. They're resistant. I think God does the same with us. We don't, we don't want Him. We don't need Him. We don't want His presence. We don't want to hear what He has to say. He, he's going to pass by. He's going to pass by. As we talked about last week with the clay, He's the, he's the potter with the clay. Think about the clay that I didn't mention last week. He wants to shape us into his image, but you can't shape the clay unless it's warm, right? That clay's got to get warm. You put it in your hands, warm it up a little. Now you can kind of start to work with it. So you got to be in his hand so you can get warm so that he can start to mold you. If you're cold, you're resistant. You're not interested? He, he, his hands are tied, right? So, God reveals himself to people who depend on him and need him. And God reveals himself to people who are not in a hurry. Imagine Moses and the burning bush. Picture Moses driving by this burning bush. He's going 75 miles an hour. And he takes a pic. He stops long enough to take a picture and put it on social media. The bush is burning, but it is not burned up. And he puts it on a story on Instagram or whatever. And he said, but God says, hey, why don't you stay for a while? By the way, why don't you take off your sandals, kick them off, because you're standing on holy ground. Be still and know that I'm God. Moses, why don't you make a well, and I will fill it. Because if you dig it, I will fill it. If you seek me, you will find me. If you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. Why don't you stay for a while? So it's, uh, so it's Wednesday night. And I uh, had a basketball game. And uh, there was some, uh, some things that went on in the stands in the first period. And so, and some things that had happened at the previous time that we played 
this level of school I won't mention. And so, uh, you know, there's tension, right? It's tension. Um, but game's tied at halftime, and I played all my players in the first half, so the second half I'm just going to go for the win. And um, with like five minutes to go, I had three starters with four fouls, and um, the refs weren't calling a lot. It was getting pretty physical. Um, and I just kind of wanted the game to be over, so I stalled with five minutes to go. Went into four corners, which coach taught me. And uh, I wanted them to try to score, but they weren't. They were just passing around. They weren't even looking to score. I wanted them to score. I didn't really want to just hold the ball for five minutes. So uh, after the game, shook hands with the other coaches, and uh, they were less than pleased and had some, you know, nothing, nothing derogatory or negative, but they just let me know how they felt about that. And so uh, I go home and I'm not really feeling great about how it ended because I actually really respect uh, the other coach and I'm replaying it all in my mind and I don't like conflict. I'm getting better at it, but I don't really like conflict. I really don't like it when people don't like me. I don't know about you. I don't really care for that. Even though I thought I would probably do it again, the same thing, I would maybe do it differently. And so I'm replaying in my mind things that I said, the choices that I made, were they the right ones? And were they the right ones for the right reasons? And so I'm troubled about it, right? And I'm troubled because, like, do I need to confess something? Do I need to ask for forgiveness about something, I'm just really searching my heart. And I just pray, Lord, uh, help me sort out um, my feelings from my actions. Help me to figure out, reveal to me what I need to do if there's anything I need to do. And I quoted the, the psalmist, search me and know me. Uh, see if there is any wicked way in me. I want God to search my heart. And I just, as soon as I prayed that, I just knew in my, my heart, in that moment, uh, that God would help me through uh, the valley of tears to the place of peace. And I had peace. Even though things weren't resolved yet, um, he helped me through uh, that valley and gave me peace that I, I didn't have two minutes before I prayed. I knew he would answer my prayer. And I, I knew in that moment there was at least one person I needed to apologize to because I made it a little personal in my response. God will help you through the valley of tears, the valley of weeping, and he will get you to the place of peace. He will even give you peace in the valley, as he did me. So I reached out to the 8th uh, grade coach. I wasn't sure what I was going to say. because I didn't want to give like a half apology. But I did apologize. I said I felt poorly about the way that things ended and um, didn't feel good about that, that I respect him as a coach. I meant no disrespect by what I did. And I explained that what I was trying to do is what happened and that's on me and I take full responsibility for that. And he wrote back a very gracious answer. And I was, so, I was scared to open it, the email, but then there was peace. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. God never, ever promised that you would never go through the valley, but he has promised that you would never have to go through the valley alone. Emmanuel, God with us. And the virgin will be with child, and his name will be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. You might remember the old story about the couple driving down the street one day, and they were listening to the radio as the man drove the car through the busy Christmas streets. As they uh, listened to the beautiful Christmas music, the wife became a little bit nostalgic and she said, Herbert, do you remember how when we were younger, we used to sit so close together as we drove along? It was so wonderful back then. What happened? I don't know, said Herbert, but all I know is that I haven't moved. <laughs> Christmas comes each year and reminds us that 
God is not the one who has moved away from us. In fact, he came to us. And if there's ever separation between us and our Heavenly Father, like there clearly was between Herbert and Ethel, we're the ones who have moved. We're the ones who chose to drift away from him. And that's the starting place because that is indeed what Christmas is all about. Jesus came into this world to set us right with God, our Heavenly Father. Jesus came into the world to save us and to bring us back to him. Will you please stand?